Hey, what's up, everyone? This is episode four or five, five maybe. I don't know. I can't remember. Uh, I'll, I'll do. I'll do it uh, in post um, of the Gom Local Live, um, and this time, uh, Erica Lekango um, joins the episode. <laughs> What's up, Erica? Um, you're uh, very humbled and um, yeah, uh, thrilled to have you on the show. Two things, actually. One, it is, today is Indigenous Peoples Day um, on the U.S. side. That's one. And two, I don't know if you know this, um, but um, today, or in, at least this today, seven years ago, um, we met at the, um, the um, Communications Summit uh, in Mexico. Um, so, so, so for people that don't know, um, I was invited to uh, a communication summit in Mexico with all the, with the communicators from Abya Yala, um, to present on the world conference. And I think, I, I can't remember, like, did, did we meet halfway through or towards the end or in the beginning? I can't remember. Do you, I do you remember we that? Halfway through. We met halfway through. Right. Okay. Um, Erika, for the people that, um, yeah, that like I was... Love- but I'm I sorry. Am, I, am, I, I am one of the people that I lo- almost lost the bus. I almost missed my bus. Remember? The the, the bus to go back to Oaxaca or? Um... Yeah, the bus was leaving to Oaxaca, and then I went back to say bye, and the bus was leaving, so I had to run. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I, I remember. I remember that I remember that, that. Um, yeah that conference very vividly, and I even have like. a almost almost a traumatic experience uh, going into um, um, Mexico um, coming from a guy that uh, does speak 11 languages but Spanish is not one of them um, so um, being invited to a meeting in Mexico with where 99.99 percent of the people uh, do not speak uh, English um, so um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll obviously we'll, we'll probably dive into that later on, um, Erica. For the people, and then this what I what I like to ask, uh, the, like the first question actually is for the people that do not know you, um, yeah, like give us like the the the, the two three minutes um, origin story of Erica, like um, uh, where you grew up, who you were at when you were a kid, um, uh, so that people can put you in the right context. Okay, so. Um... Ima Naja Mashikuna, Nyukaka Erika Linkango. Uh, buenas tardes con todos. Mi nombre es Erika Linkango. Uh, hi, everybody. Good morning, well, good afternoon. My name is Erika Linkango. I am an indigenous educator. I'm Quito Panzaleo. I was born in Quito, Ecuador from a Pansaleo mom and a Kitu dad. I am one of, I'm one of five siblings. I'm the third one. And I come from a family uh, that, that ingrained on me uh, to be proud of being indigenous, to be a proud of being Linkango. And I was raised, uh, with a duty, um, according to my parent, my, my dad, uh, as Lincangos, our duty is to create spaces for our communities to thrive. My, pa- my dad raised us um, saying that, you know, that he works hard for us to have an education and he wanted us to have different lives like they do, they did and they will always say that that we are here to create spaces um, to be employers and not employees. Um, so I feel like uh, that was something that impacted a lot of my life. Uh, my dad uh, 
raising us with the responsibility to create spaces for our community. Hmm. Um, Erica, like, and the, the funny thing is, and pe obviously people don't know about it, but like b before we went live, you're like, you, you, I asked you like one question and I like, did this whole waterfall of, of, of information and, and experiences came out. Um, cause you're a teacher now, um, currently living in Oregon, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, mother, uh, but your whole background is, um, dare I say, different from what you're doing right now. Um, you're, you're a creative strategist, international law, uh, international corporation. Um, so explain, like, take me through that process of um, how you pivoted actually from doing something that you studied for and doing something that you now love to do as being a teacher. Okay, so it has been a whole adventure. You know, um, growing up, uh, my grandma taught me that, you know, that, when, that we people uh, have different dimensions. So she said that, you know, we can cultivate different talents and different skills, you know? And within our epistemology, we are not born to do one thing all our lives. Okay, so that is a difference from like uh, our societies, you know, we specialize in doing one thing and that is the one thing we're going to learn how to do well. Uh, but I feel like um, the way I was raised, my grandma and my community, my mom, my aunties, they were sure that I was able to have a well-rounded education, meaning that in the same way that I have access to academy, I had access to traditional education. I had access to learn how to take care of the land, how to take care of animals, you know, how to do arts and, you know, our traditional handcrafts. But I also, you know, I was encouraged to pursue uh, things that I like, like languages, like poetry, like writing, you know. So I feel like um, that have a big influence in, in who I am right now and what I do. Because, you know, as I'm saying, you know, uh, I had been encouraged to cultivate all the dimensions in my life, meaning, you know, to cultivate my intellect, you know, learning languages, learning different subjects like international law, because I'm indigenous and all my rights are in international law. Well, I need to know what is what that the law says. So it's when, when, when did you realize, by the way, like, because, like, because, when you talk about international law, like that, that's like a whole step beyond law. So like, when did you realize that international law was the way to go? Okay, so, so you know, uh, as I'm saying, you know, like I was, I was encouraged to cultivate my intellect. So I went yeah. to school, I did all these things and my parents realized that I was good with languages. So they were sure that I always was uh, within to bilingual education. So I had been receiving English classes since I was five. Hmm. So uh, so then, you know, as I grew up, uh, they were always like supporting me in that part that I like languages. But also I like to talk a lot. And I also like, I don't like injustice. And I'm one of five kids. So in my household, when something happens, I am the middle one. So I'm kind of put in a situation that I have to organize. I have to listen to the truth. And I have in some way to to make amendments within my siblings, you know? So I have always had that kind of role in the middle. So my mom will always say like, you will be a good lawyer. They will always say that, okay? Mm. So because I'm always like defending my brother from my sister or like backwards and things like that. So that was how like these uh, ideas start coming out to me. But honestly, I never, I never knew about my situation as an indigenous woman within this society until I was 19, because I was raised to believe that I have no limitations. My parents never told me, you know, Erica, you're indigenous, and just so you know, head up, there's going to be things and spaces that you're not going to be allowed because of your lincango. They never told me that. You know, so I, I, was, I, I grew up without any limitations. And as I started like going to the academy, into college, you know, I could feel this in high school, 
these weird like kind of things, but I didn't understood. You know, I didn't understand why I feel so weird and uncomfortable in certain spaces. Why sometimes when my teachers say things, I feel uncomfortable and it's kind of a little hurtful sometimes, but I cannot explain this because I don't know who I am at this point because I I was not conscious of my of, of assuming my identity as an indigenous person. You know, I just knew that people would make fun of my last names. Hmm. You know? So then, you know, I went to college and I went to a, you know, my dad believes that education is an investment. And my whole family invested on me. And I went to study in college and I went to get a degree on journalism because, you know, I really like to read and write and all this stuff. So I went for journalism because, you know, uh, I wanted to do art, but my family was more focused in for me to have a well, a better future and arts in their conception were not going to provide that for me. So after high school that I graduated as a bilingual secretary, I went to college to become a journalist, you know? And I was kind of like the very first uh, in my family that went to college to pursue something that was not technical, mm. you know? Um, there was a lot of, uh, for me, my family encouraged me to become a secretary because, you know, as a secretary, I can find a job and I can do this and that, you know. And so I, I became a secretary and a bilingual secretary because I spoke English. But, you know, I didn't want to be a secretary. <laughs> so I was kind of like, I want to do something else. So I had the opportunity to go to, to the school. My dad supported me. I went to journalism school. And it's in there when I discovered who I was and my situation when I met my very first indigenous educator, my very first indigenous teacher. And can you, can you remember the name of that uh, teacher? Um, let me think about the name of my teacher. Unfortunately, right now I don't remember from the top of my head. That's, that's okay. Because Just it's a long time ago, but he he was a Saraguro man, a Saraguro from Loja, Ecuadorian Saraguro man. And he told me, you know, in front of the whole class, 45 students, this is a Catholic, the Catholic University of Ecuador, Opus Dei University. And he is talking and taking attendance. And then he says, Erika Lucia Lincano Vilca, por favor, ponte de pie. So he calls my full name and tell me, please stand up. And I was scared because I wasn't paying attention and I thought that I did something wrong. You know, so I stand up and I was surprised he, what he told me. He told me, you know, I want to see you because it's very beautiful knowing that these last names are among all these people. And he pointed out how my last name belonged to this territory. And I was the only student that was indigenous, but I didn't know I was indigenous. And I was 19. Mm. And I spoke already English. And it was a sad day for me. Because I understood many things and I feel embarrassed. How because so? I because I spoke English. I spoke English and nobody told me the importance of speaking my own language. I think that was like one of the more, the promise I feel so much pride of being who I am, but at the same time, sad because I really didn't know who I was, but he knew who I was. And I was, and I think that was important for me. It was important because this teacher understood what I was doing in there. And he wanted to point out that that he sees me within a system of education that is that is blind to color, that is blind to ethnicities. So that really marked my life because after that I went home and I talked to my parents. Why? Why you didn't tell me this? Why these things? So then I learned about my dad, about how was his education. And I understood a lot of things that I have witnessed 
um, you know, racism against me, my family, my dad, you know, people taking advantage of my dad, making him work and not paying him, you know, things like that. So then I understood, like, you know, there is something else that I need to learn. And then I start, like, looking about what, did, what does it mean to be indigenous, you know? So I start learning, and I, I like to read a lot. So and then in my readings, I, I, I came to the conclusion that we don't have rights, you know? And I was like, <laughs> this was back in 1990, 1999. And I remember this because there was a struggle that we were going, we were, my country was becoming dollarized. I was living still in Ecuador. And that's why I, how I remember. No, we, between like seeing the indigenous resistance against the international monetary funding, seeing the, the, the indigenous arising against like, you know, these neoliberal politics and, you know, and seeing them, you know, I am Quito from Quito from the main, uh, from the capital. You know, we are like the first nations that were there and that we are still there. We are, we are still there. I literally go back home. When I go back home to Ecuador, I go back to the same place where I was born. So when, you know, like, and just understanding, you know, oh, you know, I am, I'm indigenous too. Understanding my whole uh, historical process and remembering, you know, oh, now I remember how, what happened when I was nine and cars from the government came and took all our forest down. They put a highway from the middle of our house. Oh, now this makes sense. You know, now I start understanding all these things. And I went back uh, to things that I had written, you know, when I was 16 in high school. I, I, I had to write a document because I was a secretary. I was trying to become a secretary and I had to do this document of different documents and they were different letters and I needed a government letter. So mm -hmm. I took this government letter that I found in my mom's documents and I just type it, you know, I type it when I was 16. And I just typed it because I needed this document to finish my homework. But when I was 19, I went back to that letter that I typed when I was 16. That letter says that my grandfather donates his lands for the nation state to Ecuador to put a highway in our territory. But we know that he never donated that. But it, is, it says that that and is in that document. So then I became angry because I understood a lot. And then I wanted to know why. I wanted to know why this is happening to us and why this is continuing to happen to us. Maybe no, it's not me and my family because our lands are already taken now our I used to, I used to come from a forest, but now it's a highway. So I just started doing research. You know, I like reading, and then I uh, it was like I read a bunch uh, different things. You know, like trying to understand political economy, uh, trying to understand like what is cultural and social political rights. Uh, why don't we have this? So then I learned that we don't have, we don't have rights. I learned mm -hmm. that in 2006, there was recently like meeting people, recently meeting to learn about how, how can we get rights? So I was like, wow. But this was in 2006. In 2006, I already was like almost 26. Mm -hmm. I already had my daughter. I was pregnant on my daughter. When, when I learned, oh, so now animals have rights, but we indigenous peoples don't, you know? So I start following up, you know, I start following all these little meetings that we were doing the drafting, all the drafting about the indigenous people, right? So I just start following up, reading everything that came. And then um, by 2004, uh, for, to, in 2004, I moved from Ecuador to Eugene. And in 2006, I was already pregnant with my daughter when I learned we don't have rights. 
So um, during the time I came in Eugene, 2004, I started learning as much as I could the language. Even though I already spoke Ecuadorian English, I tried to do my best to take some classes and try to um, get better, you know, with my, um, with my English. So in this process, I decided I had to go back to study because, you know, um, I studied journalism in Ecuador. And uh, when I came, even though I finished the program, when I came here, I cannot have my journalism degree and I cannot be a journalist in here because I live in another country. And if I, I want to be who I want to be or who I was before, I need to go back to college and I need to go back through the same system. So with a daughter this time. So it took me a long time. I was super sad and depressed. Uh, it took me four years to be able to feel strong enough that I can do this. So by 2008, I was accepted at the journalism school at the University of Oregon. And I, you know, I became a, a public relations and advertiser practitioner is what I focus in journalism school because I feel that uh, media and, and all these uh, marketing strategies are very powerful because they can make people want things that they don't need. I can use to teach people things that they don't want to learn. So that is like, oh, I, I need to stay here. So it's like, you know, one of my the, my classes that I that is one of like the, my favorites was called Top Consumer Culture which taught me about United States and understanding a little bit the culture and people. And, you know, just uh, we need the, this. Uh, so, but I always have this, this truth in my heart, you know, I'm indigenous. I'm still like in this camp called, in Ecuador, I mean, in, in here in Oregon, I was still the only person of color. <laughs> I was still the only indigenous person because in Ecuador, I didn't know I was a person of color. Hmm. But now I know because I have been told. So now, you know, in journalism school, I had to do all this work. But, you know, I, I had to be true to what are my passions. So every time I had to research something, I will research about indigenous people's rights. And I will work that in many different ways so I can be doing this work. So I start monitoring and everything, always talking about this, you know, like... In, I know that in 2010, in 2007, there was like the, 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 it was kind of the drafting was done. We were going talking about the implementation. So like following up close, like in 2000, uh, I graduated with a document uh, of 150 pages research document regarding a question. And my question was, should all the international mechanisms guarantee and support indigenous indigenous peoples uh, economic political and cultural autonomy for ma resources management and conservation so pretty much i was saying that wouldn't it be better that actually indigenous peoples are the one that manage their territories for, cons for conservation and resource management. Who better than the owners of the house to tell how the house has to be taken care of, isn't it? So that was my question, you know. Should we actually give this to indigenous nations, you know? So it was very heartbroken, like the comments I received, because, you know, when I started my research project, uh, the very first thing someone told me was like, don't you think this is too ambitious? You're asking people to give the right to the indigenous peoples to manage and do these things. Don't you think this is too ambitious? So I, I, my response was like, well, it has been more than 500 years. I don't think it's ambitious to wanna finally have home back, you know? Yeah. So, so I continue. And that was my document. I have that research document and pretty much is talking about indigenous peoples worldwide, you know, and in my end, they're trying to understand, you know, trying to understand, you know, how this works, you know, 
uh, but you know, I had just some just parts, you know, just parts of knowledge, and didn't I didn't have a big picture of what it was. So I decided that I need to do something else. I need to keep learning and understand how indigenous people go didn't got rights within the right repartitions, how we didn't got them. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, you know, I, I found, you know, I, I found these, um, these professors that, you know, they, uh, law professors that they told me because I was, I was trying to understand sovereignty, what sovereignty means. What do we need? What do indigenous peoples need? Sovereignty or we need autonomy? You know, so then I learned that we are already sovereign. We don't need anyone to tell us that we're sovereign. I'm like, oh, okay, so then we need autonomy. So just trying to navigate the words. So then, uh, you know, I finished my, my career at University of Oregon, I graduate. I finished my paper, but I was still curious. I still wanted to know more. Mm -hmm. So then, um, you know, I I have a little, a hard time, you know, after that, because, you know, bec becoming, uh, being so much in the academy, being far from the territory, and then this disconnect with the people. So I decided to um, to embark in an adventure and start learning more about indigenous communication. You know, indigenous communications because I have, uh, you know, I'm indigenous. So when I go home, I see my friends. I know the struggle. I'm familiar with the struggle. You know. And I, I wanted to keep connected. So, you know, I, I, you know, I'm lucky enough to have all my family in Ecuador. All my friends are still in Ecuador. I'm the only one that is here. So I still didn't lose that connection with, with my territory. So I was like, okay, so I'm going, to, um, I'm going to keep doing this. And they supported me. So I found, uh, they sent me the link of the, uh, the, the second, Intercontinental Indigenous Communication Summit. So uh, I I I travel to that, and it's where I met you. Mm -hmm. And you know this, uh, you know something that happened before this was, you know, as a media journalist, I know about cameras, I know about you know how to make videos, how to make uh, graphic design, and stuff, all these those all these things. So I was um, I was. You know, I was invited to do different kinds of jobs, you know, within this uh, this field. It's how I started working at the University of Oregon. You people would hire me to take pictures, to make videos, to translate things. It's how kind of I started. But, you know, I was very interested in learning about indigenous people. So I was sure to be, um, to be going to, you know, like gender studies, to ethnic studies, to all these faculties, environmental studies. And here in Eugene, they have the PILC, the Public Interest Environmental Law, uh, you know, conference, which is one of the biggest one in the country. So I, you know, that is one of the events that I don't miss. So I will go, I will go out and just to listen all these indigenous lawyers talking about what is happening in their territories, you know, and I didn't even spoke lawyer English. <laughs> I just will go there and just see them trying to pick up stuff and try to write uh, words down. And then uh, I met this amazing person and that gave me the opportunity to uh, to accompany a Mapuche delegation to the Inter-American Human Rights Court. To, to um, they were going to to uh, to start the the international demand against the Chilean government for the wrong application and implementation of the anti-terrorist law against Mapuche nation, mm -hmm. ancestral demands. So, you know, like being in there, you know, like at this point, I already knew we didn't have rights. At this point, I already knew that we, we you know, we, our rights are in the international law. And, you know, I, I was not a lawyer, but my job was the cameras. My job was to be sure that, that this truth is going to be out there. You know, so uh, so just seeing the process and I'm like, oh, this is, you know, this, I need to learn more. There is more behind this because, you know, we don't have lawyers, but hey, there is an anti-terrorist law that is being applied to our people and to us, people without rights. 
So then I started getting more worried about the situation. And I learned that there was this, uh, a program called um, Expert on Indigenous People's Human Rights and International Cooperation that is led by the uh, Indigenous Funding. The Fondo Indigena, Indigenous Funding okay. in, in Spain. So I applied for the scholarship and I couldn't get in the scholarship because even though I do serve for my confederations and different groups in grass group groups, I couldn't I couldn't have what they were asking me. So uh, so I was able to attend. Thank you to the community where I live in Eugene uh, because ever since I arrived into this community, I had to be sure to be an authentic Linkango, meaning that you know creating the space for our communities to thrive. So uh, people in my community have seen me working. I have served uh, for like organizations like the NWCP, the local chapter. I have support LULAG. I also support uh, the Asian Council and other organizations in town, like uh, student organizations like the, uh, the Coalition Against Environmental Racism, the Native American Student Union. I had the pleasure to work at the Women's Center. So all these organizations that have seen me working and see me doing and like wondering about this, uh, you know, when I ask for help and say, hey, I want to go to Spain to do this and I'm going to do this. So I, I, I had a car accident too. And at this point I was recovering from my car accident. So I was mm -hmm. not working. And when I saw this, uh, these uh, classes, this this program that will help me understand all these things I have in my mind. You know, even though you know I was recovering from the accident, I I was sure to mobilize my people uh, and to tell them what what were my dreams and what I wanted to do. So I cooked, I cooked ceviche and ornado, which are traditional dishes from my country, and I put together an event where I share with my community what I can do, mm. not just my intellect and the things I do, like the camera and the things, but also who I am. And because, you know, this is so important, I want to learn about the reality that is affecting my people. So it seemed appropriate to use what I had been taught by my people to be able to move forward. So I share a little bit of my culture and comfort food. I, I cook a, a massive ceviche and massive ornado and I, I am I am a weaver I'm a weaver and I create all kinds of like traditional weavings and, and you know I put all my art out and my food out and I remember I think I I think I sold 18 1800 dollars that day like in five hours I was able to put together uh, what I needed Someone donated the, the, the fly for me to go to Spain. And, you know, it was my community that came through. And it was people from all, you know, all colors people from all parts of the world that came to support me. And that was special. So even though I didn't got a scholarship from, from Carlos Tres, the university, my community kind of like make it happen. And that was beautiful. And I went to Spain to study to become an expert on indigenous people's human rights and international cooperation. And so when I, when I finally was able to make it and talk to my family in Ecuador and my friends, everybody was like, oh my gosh. They were like, why? Why are you going to Spain to become an expert on indigenous people? They don't even have indigenous people. What they are talking about? You know, there's more indigenous people here in your country. You should come here and study here, you know? And totally, it makes sense, you know, it's like, why do I need to go to Spain to learn about my rights? Why? You know, mm -hmm. but I went anyways, you know, and Lincangos, uh, as many other families in Ecuador, in 2000, with the dollarization, many of our families uh, had a struggle to be able to survive in our own country. You know, many people, many of our people like left. It's in 2000 when migration start happening in Ecuador. There is a massive wave of migration from Ecuadorians to, 
to United States and to Europe, to Spain and to New York, you know? So pretty much, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not kidding when I'm saying that migrants, is the migrant people, the Ecuadorians that left, are the ones who are sustaining the dollarization in Ecuador until now. Mm -hmm. You know, because we live in a in a foreign economy, we use dollars and American uh, American dollars as national currency. So, within this wave of migration, a lot of people were disarticulated. Many people like migrate, um, and we were not uh, we were not like the family that didn't have to go through. We also had my my brother migrated to Spain. You know, and he lived in there. So when I went to Spain, the, the cool thing I had in my heart is that there is someone in there, you know? So I, with that in my heart, I left. And I left my daughter too. I left my daughter so I can do wow. this work because it was important. And it's not important because it's something I want for my life, like materially, but it's something that I want for healing. And th so when I went to Spain, uh, I was able to see the migration in Spain. And that was another beautiful thing, you know, learning about how our migrants, our indigenous nations go to other territories and they hold tight and dearly our culture. So I call, I call Madrid tiny Ecuador. <laughs> I call the tiny Ecuador because, oh my gosh, it's like tiny Ecuador. And I, I was so happy in Spain. I never thought I was going to be so happy. I even miss it. It was because it was so, Madrid was so Ecuadorian for me. <laughs> so uh, so during this trip in, in, in Madrid is when I opened my eyes to the truth. I went there because the best um, teachers I have read about <laughs> were part of the program. And that's why I went to Spain. You know, in my research, 150 pages document, I came to the only indigenous person that has been able to recover land in front of a nation state, uh, Anaya. Mm. So I want him to be my professor. I wanted to learn from James Anaya, yeah. a special reporter of indigenous people, right? He has been a person that has been following all, ever since I, I, I went through. So through the journalism school, when I was writing this document, I dared to call teacher Maestro Anaya. I called Maestro James Anaya and I told him, I'm trying to decide about my thesis. I don't know if it is sovereignty or autonomy. <laughs> like I was so lost, mm -hmm. you know, and, and he, he was so nice. He told me, you know, you had to read this chapter of this book. It was his book. So when I see this program, James and Naya is part of the teachers group and other people super, super like important within the indigenous people's uh, rights m movement, you know? So I was like, oh, I want these people to be my teachers because obviously they understand this. So yeah. I, so that was, that's why I went to Spain and, um, you know, it was a very interesting experience because, you know, as in any other part of the world, we are still humans. You know, we are all human beings. We, we have good and bad. We have evil and good. You know, we are, that is part of who we are. You know, so it was a very interesting experience in Spain too, for me. You know, it was like a cultural shock coming from the United States and seeing tall, light-skinned people and going to Spain to see short, light-skinned people that speak Spanish to you. That was very shocking for my brain too. But it was very good for me to go and they, there and understand that as an indigenous person, I had to go to Europe, to Spain, to learn about my rights because all when Europeans arrived to the Americas, they they did they documented, they mapped, they did all kinds of maps. So all the maps of our continents are in Spain, in Sevilla. You know, this the 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 Indians files, El Archivo de Indians, it does exist. You know, it's not like you know, it's not like someone like just telling a story, it actually exists. 
you know, and in this uh, in this institution, you can find all the maps, the ancient maps. So that was super interesting to me, you know. So that's why we had to go to Spain, because Spain, because they are the ones that colonize us, is Spain who decided what was going to be the territorial law. Mm -hmm. So it was the king that after taking the lands from the natives, then say like, oh, I'm a good king. I'm going to give back land, but this is how I'm going to give it. So I was like, oh, oh my God. You know, like I'm just learning all this stuff. It's like, okay, so there was a reason why I had to come to Spain, you know? And then uh, from there, you know, just learning that as indigenous nations, we we got rights, not be, not for being humans, not for being indigenous, not for being First Nations, but for our conditions of living under slavery and forced work. That is what gives us rights because people saw us as workers or as slaves. And it's how the international working organization gave us the hand so we can go under the umbrella of the workers organization to get mm -hmm. rights am i wrong <laughs> no it's it's you're talking about international labor organization right so yeah um, the international no, it's, labor organization yeah, ILO. So, hmm. so it's how we got the rights. so it's like oh so you know like coming on to all these truths and you know and it was very healing healing hmm. for me because when i after i finished this program i went home and I talk to my dad and I give him a big hug and I said, thank you. And I share with him everything I learned and to my mom. Ever since I learned, oh, I learned so much, so much. Like, and for so much amazing people. Like, I even learned uh, people who are religious out there, <laughs> who are Catholics. I even learned that Eve was the second woman in creation. And that the very first women of creation was Lilith. Lilith? Lilith. Oh, yeah. Okay. And Lilith shows up in the New Testament as the serpent. Oh. She does okay. show up. But you know, uh, and I learned this from a, from a former uh, arzobispo, I don't know how to say it, from a former person from the church, you know, that was our teacher who was our teacher and who was te like teaching us about uh, religion and indigenous peoples. What has been the, in the context, how has it been the relationship between indigenous nations and, and the church? Mm -hmm. And then is when I learned, you know, we learn about, you know, there is this other woman in creation of the Catholic creation that is being ignored. And then they just talk about Eve. So that was super interesting because, you know, my family is Catholic. So just going to talk to this and kind of like taking all these myths away from my family has been healing, you know, because it has helped empower women and also empower my dad who went through kind of boarding school. You know, kind of humanizing ourselves as natives and as resistance instead of like, you know, merciless Indian savages. So, uh, you know, as I'm saying, you know, for me, and going to Spain and doing all this, uh, all this uh, learning, you know, I, I know I'm not going to get rich from this. But I'm learning because this is about liberation. Hmm. This is about healing. This is about setting our people for success. Is creating right. spaces for our communities to thrive. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, now that I know everything, and then, it, well, not everything, but everything regarding like our situation as indigenous peoples within the international system, I went back home and, you know, and share as much as I could. Unfortunately, you know, there is a lot of things as indigenous women we have to go through. And part of my job, you know, as an indigenous migrant journalist, as you met me in Mexico, 
uh, traveling and doing this work that is political, you know, because it's, it's trying to resist within a world that's telling you that you have to become citizen when you know that you are ancient. Hmm. So, uh, so in my last, uh, the last time I went to the third international, you know, the, the third intercontinental indigenous communication summit in Cochabamba, Bolivia, I didn't have a good experience. Uh, uh, I was sleeping and I woke up at 2 a.m. because someone was trying to rape me. And it was not a good experience. I spent most of my time uh, trying to bring justice. Luckily, and it's not really that lucky, but the person that attacked me that night attacked three other women the same night. And it's how we were able to get him. So it's, it's sad to talk these things because, you know, it's also about, you know, being a woman, being an indigenous woman and being in different spaces from dominant culture and, you know, trying to navigate those spaces within the in institutional racism, but also being in spaces that are for us being a woman and not feeling safe. So after after that that last experience, uh, I just decided to take a time and to think about what I was doing. I also decided by this point, you know, my, my life was changing. I was taking a different route. Uh, you know, understanding who I am and knowing uh, the reality um, teach you that there are things in life that are non-negotiable. And for me, I learned that, you know, and my safety, my body, my health, my mental health is important too. So I decided to take a break uh, of traveling alone and doing all this work because it's exhilarating, it's amazing. You met so many people. But you also, you know, we live in a, in a world where missing a murder indigenous women is kind of a formality, you know? Uh, there is a lot of violence and, and that, you know, a fear. And that was not the first, and I'm pretty sure, unfortunately, I cannot say it's the last time that I will be sexually assaulted or attacked. But what I can say is that as a teacher, as an educator, as an abolitionist, the only thing I can do is teach and bring awareness to my students and my families about these issues and these situations in a way that we can be the beginning of a, a place where we can all stop perpetuating these systems of oppression of those relations of power you know i'm talking about racism i'm talking about sexism i'm talking about violence against women and, and girls mm -hmm. and non-binary people you know so i have faced that too so and you know and now when i am a teacher and i am in the classroom I talk to my students and the truth is that the world is ugly. The world out there is ugly. Like there's so many things beautiful, but the system that is controlling our world is ugly because it puts profit over people. If it puts profit over nature, is put profit over browns and black bodies. So it's ugly and it has to be changed. It has to be abolished. We need a different system. We need to create other realities. So that's why I became a teacher because I need help. And understanding this, that 
the whole system is set up for indigenous peoples to disappear because that's the truth. Every nation state has in their constitution something that says that it doesn't matter what resource you have in your land, but if it is under, I don't remember how many mares deep on the soil, that belongs to the state. Every constitution. And that's why they can claim national interest. And this is how they can take that land from indigenous nations. Mm -hmm. So then I start, like, the more I learn, the more I read, it's like being in a maze, you know? It's being in a maze. And go to one side, go to the other, and you just realize that there is not a door there. But you just keep walking around trying to find the door. But, you know, it's just going around and around. And here we are, 2020. Yes, we have rights. Yes, they are recognized. Are they ratified? Can we benefit from these rights within, within the cities, within the places we live? Can we? No, we don't. So I realized that the system has um, the system has don't have the human or the material infrastructure to guarantee that indigenous people's rights are implemented. They don't. Mm -hmm. I need to. I'm sorry. So, um, so I learned that, you know, that, you know, it, what, do, what good is, what would it means to have rights when they cannot be ratified? What would it mean to have rights that we know that they are just in paper? So, so then um, I decided to become a teacher because I need help. And also, I need to have hope. I need to have hope that that we can do better. That I can do better. Mm -hmm. That our generation can do better. So when I go to my classroom, I'll be sure to talk to my students about these realities. For example, just the fact that I am an indigenous teacher blows their mind because many of my students think that indigenous people don't exist anymore because they don't see us in the media. So just the fact that I stand in front of them and they know I'm Kitu Pansaleo and they know that I speak an indigenous language and they know I'm indigenous and they know I'm proud. That is changing the narrative within their lives, but also is empowering to those students for migrants themselves, whose language is not Spanish even, but they are also indigenous. Because that is a, a, here in Eugene, there is a strong indigenous migrant population who speak Maya, Mistec, or Nahuatl. And these communities are isolated because they don't speak Spanish or English. Mm -hmm. So as an indigenous educator, I can see um, the need to open up the dialogue about issues and conversations that have been silenced. How, how do you go about that then? as in methods or how do you, what, what is your style of teaching? My style of teaching, well, as uh, as many other teachers, you know, I had to follow the standards, the Oregon standards, and I had to be sure that my students are receiving, uh, you know, the curriculum. Uh, I, I teach for grade Spanish immersion, and that means that I teach all the subjects. I teach mm -hmm. uh, science, I teach social studies, English, English writing, um, I teach language arts, English language arts and Spanish language arts. So uh, today in my classroom, we talk about indigenous people's days, you know, 
International Indigenous People Day, and you know, I'm just asking them, like, how many of them are, have celebrated this before? How, like, how many of them have heard about this before, you know? And that is like so amazing to learn that, you know, in my classroom of 25, just one student, just one student have heard about this before. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know. Is there a capability to to share a screen, amigo? So, sorry, what? Can Can you share a screen? Can I share my screen? Um. Yeah, oh, yeah, I... yeah, you can. Yeah. Okay. Do can... you need to give me permission to share my screen? No, no. You have to. You can click it yourself. Okay, I'll try. Fine. I can see. Okay, I I just lost the the window where we're talking. I'm sorry. Okay, but but just um, since I cannot find it, but you know what I do is I use since I I I know media. I study media. I do my best that all my classes are audiovisual. That I have visuals because I, right now we're doing distance learning, and it's okay. already difficult. And you know. And this is when all these media knowledge have come very handy to me because, you know, before I used to do, do media and I was all the time behind the cameras and being sure that everything looks well, that the sound and everything. But now I am in front of the camera. So yeah. it's very interesting uh, shift that I'm living now because now it's me that has to be in the camera. It's me that has to be doing all the talking. But, you know, I feel like... Uh, I'm blessed because now I have the opportunity to be in the other side of the screen and, you know, just um, to have this space to also overcome fears about, you know, public speaking or like just trying to be sure that I'm, that, you know, people understand my broken English and things like that. Uh, mm-hmm. But for example, today I was sure to, to offer some history about our, when did Indigenous People's Day started? Because no, like some friends, you know, I was telling them, I called them friends. My friends didn't know. So I was like, well, you know, let's learn. When did this start? Why is this important, you know? And and when I talk, I ask if, please raise your hand or give me a little heart if you have heard about Columbus. And half of the class have heard about Columbus. And the other half, don't know but you know just one person knows about indigenous people they so then i see the need and the role of the educator with this within this um restorative um justice justice process within our societies and in our communities Mm -hmm. because i just feel that you know if the teachers are not teaching the truth of history who is teaching this All right you also you also um, um, talked a little bit about um yeah using that audio visual thing um yeah to amplify your message and um yeah teach history um because you also like created like um yeah, uh, creative strategies as well. So, uh, what uh, what would you say, or what would you advise Indigenous peoples that are trying to use um, those uh, medium like that to, yeah, uh, to yeah, um, advertise? No, 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 not advertise, uh, but to, to uh, get more, the- yeah, amplify their voice or um, get their struggles known to the wider public. Okay, so my advice, it would be like first to have hope for better times because I know that good things are coming. I know that um, right now, like the situation of the world, uh, it's la- it seems messy, but you know, I feel that um, it gets messy before like everything comes together. Mm-hmm. and. I will encourage you to learn as much as you can different skills that you can 
And then you can always find ways to integrate. For example, within my job, you know, right now uh, I am a communication strategist. So I'm using this knowledge on how to target the specific skills to my students. How can I uh, be sure that my students are learning from what I'm teaching? Uh, for example, while, while we are um, connected online, I am doing my presentation. I'm going to be sure that uh, I'm interacting with my students, you know, like just like in a radio show, you know. I, I now I feel like being a teacher is not as different as being a, a MC in a radio station because that is my background. I did radio a couple of years when I was uh, probably from 19 to 21. I did radio. So now it's like, oh, you know, it's like being in radio. It's like, talking with my students and I just feel like now, you know, after being a, a communication strategist for so long and using a lot of technology and uh, different platforms to communicate and amplify messages. Now as a teacher, I go back to what is to be, what is indigenous communication again? Because you know, like uh, communication is not only being with the camera, being with the microphone, is also having the ability to have a conversation, but mm -hmm. also in my case as a, as a teacher, it's kind of a, a facilitator role, you know? I'm there to, to facilitate the learning process. And in my understanding, when I'm, you know, when we are learning, especially we're learning to speak a different language, the only way mm -hmm. that we can achieve the goal is by speaking, right. you know? So it's like how, um, how I can facilitate these spaces that are safe, you know, for my students to be able to learn in a, in a kind environment, you mm -hmm. know? Because, you know, like all these, my students, um, most of my students are, are heritage language speakers meaning that uh, they their first language is other than English. So, you know, understanding that 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 diversity within my audience and as a teacher, knowing that I have also limitations, you know, I have the limitation of time. I have I have a specific set of skills that I had to teach. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like um, integrating everything that I learned in the radio or in, in any media communication media. Okay, so I need to have three minutes of intro and during this time I'm going to be having like five minutes of a, uh, five minutes of break and I'm going to have a two minute song that is going to be playing and I'm going to be dancing with my students for two minutes before we jump in math, before we start doing math. So it's kind of like uh, thinking about what it, you know, how it feels to be out there you know, in front of the computer and not being in relate, you know, don't have any other human to relate to, mm. you know? And because right now of the situation, the COVID and within Oregon, we have um, a lot of um, fires and and things that have been happening that have keep us inside of the hub and isolated from, from the community. You know, um, it's just kind of trying to engage the students by using the same media tools that the corporation is doing. For example, uh, those emoji things, you know, those the little emojis. I never in my life I thought I would be doing emojis, but I learned that my students listen my emoji more than they listen to me. <laughs> so when I'm doing my presentations, my classroom presentations, um, you know, they are always going to start with my emoji. Um, I, I do a voice over in my emoji so they can listen to my voice. And I'm saying I'm greeting them and I'm telling them what is going to be the day. What are we going to be talking? And I just like go in a glance, um, the structure of the day. And, and we start sharing. We do mostly in Zoom. Uh, so uh, learning a lot how how to use these platforms to be able to create the spaces for students to share, you know, in little breaker rooms, and then, you know, giving them time for them to articulate ideas, to talk, 
you know, and then bring them back to the whole to the whole group, and then you know, talking and sharing what we learn in the small groups, just like what we do when we want to take decisions within our organizations. You know, it's just kind of being sure that all the voices are here, that every person in there is honored, and that mm-hmm. that you know that working hard to be sure that my lesson and my planning, you know relate to my students you know just like when we are doing media and we are you know giving a message we want that the message is consistent we want that the message is clear in the same way you know i have to be be sure that my message is consistent that my message is clear and more than anything that that my that my message has facts and i think um i appreciate a lot that journalistic background i have been able to acquire thanks to my parents and my family and my community. Uh, that helps me a lot because what, what, what I bring to my classroom is, you know, data, which is, uh, you know, factual data. For example, today I share with my students that indigenous people, they was first honored in Berkeley, California in 1992. And I shared that this year is significant because it marked the 500 year anniversary of Christopher Columbus coming to the Americas. Then we talk a little bit on how, you know, here in Eugene, uh, in October 2016 is when it was the very first time the city of Eugene celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day. But mm-hmm. as a state in Oregon, you know, it was in 2017 when uh, the governor K. Brown declared October 9th as Indigenous Peoples Day. In response to the Climate Tribes Youth Council, it forced to find alternatives to Columbus Day. So, mm-hmm. you know, this is important for students to know that there is young Indigenous people going into these councils to show that there is alternatives to celebrate this day that is more culturally and human more culturally appropriate and more human. And, you know, and I think this is important because I think it's important for students to know that, you know, they live in a state that ha- is one of the few that have um, embodied this, this, uh, this need of creating a space for First Nations. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not saying that this state is perfect, but there is few things that I appreciate too, you know, like for example, Right now we have the SB 13 that is like, it's called uh, in Native History, Shared History. And it is like actually a law uh, in Oregon for teachers to teach the truth of what happened with First Nations within this United States nation. So as a teacher, as an indigenous abolitionist educator, I want to create spaces within my classroom that are appropriate, that they are factual, and they are human. Mm -hmm. So we can, you know, we can have these conversations. Because, you know, uh, also, you know, I think part of the healing is reflecting. And, you know, with my students, we reflect today how Indigenous People Days is important because it draws attention to the story of Christopher Columbus and helps recognize the value of cultures and to remember that we live on indigenous territories. In the case in Eugene, we live in Kalapuya territories. And I think that is very important because, you know, um, it was shared to me by this uh, elder from Stanley Rox's tribe And she says that the very first sovereignty of a human being is to know who you are and where you come from. And I do believe that. Mm. And I think that the issue we're living right now as a society, uh, specifically about the racism, about the open white supremacy, I think um, the the issue in there is that we as human beings are not sovereign. Not many of us know who we are or where we come from. You know, many, many people 
within our societies have forgotten or were never told who they are to the point that they have forgotten that they do have culture. They have forgotten that they do come from ancient people. They have forgotten that that their story didn't start with the nation state that inhabits now in their territories. Mm. So by what I'm trying to do in here is I want to try to inspire my students. I want to inspire my students by, by helping them remember that they are also migrants, that they are also indigenous to a specific geographical location, that they do have elders and they do have ancestors. And I just feel that, that you know, by raising awareness about these truths, because, you know, this is also a truth that it has not been say to them you know mm -hmm. because you know for some reason we live in a country that prides prides itself of saying there is a culture without culture but you know this issue of being a culture without cult without a culture is just creating an emptiness within people's spirits because they don't have a community mm. So talk to me too about the um and we're also running out of time because i really wanted to, um um yeah hear you talk about it is that, that art project that you're talking about that mural like uh, like art to promote social justice um yeah can you, like talk to me about that okay so as 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 a indigenous art educator uh you know we as community indigenous migrant Latinx community who live here in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, we got together within a process, within a frame of a celebration called Fiesta Cultural. And, and we were giving a space to bring the voice of our community. And the best way that the community thought it would be uh, to share our truth would be through art. So we facilitate with uh, an artist, with a local artist from Portland. We facilitate different meetings where the community came and talk about things that are happening within the community. So we can know what are the important issues that have to be addressed. So within those meetings, uh, you know, we, we talk about about the oppression we live because at the beginning we were just talking about you know being in this land kayapuya land and acknowledging the land and the history and the people you know so all the images that came it was beautiful it was all beautiful nature mountains you know and our people working and also indigenous nations taking care of the land and us migrants coming here to this land and also coming here to help these lands because you know here in Oregon the Latino indigenous migrant community are the ones who sustain the full sovereignty of this state if it's not for, of the whole nation mm -hmm. so so it's like you know trying to show this reality and then in you know it was all beautiful but you know there is also this opening to other things, other feelings that are not just nice and beautiful, you know? So then someone in, in, in the meeting talked, you know, I don't want to disrespect, but you know, the art is beautiful and the image is amazing, but that is not the whole truth. Our truth in these territories is also difficult. You know, we're targeted. There is a whole system that is designed to, you know, to oppress us. So how are we representing that in, in this art, you know? So, and that is the truth, that is a truthful voice. So, you know, that call us all to talk about, well, so what is happening in the community? So, you know, then the community talk and uh, a case came into the, into the 
the whole art and the community decided that they wanted to add a, a, a person within a person within this art. And this person is Charlie Landeros, Mexican Filipino. Um, Charlie pronouns were they, theirs, them, non-binary. Mm. And uh, Charlie uh, was a dad, was a vet, was a student at the university, was a community activist, was a community organizer. And the community wants to humanize his story, their story, sorry. The community want to humanize their story, want to humanize Charlie. Because all the narratives about Charlie and about what happened had been very dishumanizing, not just for Charlie, their family, but also for their community. So while the community is working so hard to humanize a member, there is a group of people that is working very hard to dehumanize him, dehumanize this person. And there, there are so many um, perspectives and opinions, um, but there is not a lot of um, investigation. There is not a lot of um, studies. So the community is still mourning. The community is still mourning. And now the community is facing um, an attack on the, their first am amendment as people um, who work for the local police department are not happy that Charlie is part of the mural and they are not happy that the mural features a person in uniform. Hmm. Uh, but you know, uh, there was a stories that were published in the local media outlets and all those stories are one-sided. Um, just one part of the family of Charlie is having all the media attention and that part of the family is the part of the family that that benefits from institutionalized racism, that benefits from white privilege, while the other part of Charlie's family, the part that doesn't benefit from institutional racism, that doesn't benefit from white privilege, are not having the same space. So interesting enough, this this mural had become um, the beginning of a conversation that a lot of people have tried not to have, but now is in there. Uh, a lot of people are putting pressure for the mural to be taken down because uh, they say that the mural is traumatizing the police, uh, the police members, who were involved in Charlie's case. Um, there is person, people are saying that um, that is disrespectful to have, have Charlie in there. Uh, but the community have chosen to keep Charlie there to humanize and to call attention to a truth and a story that needs attention, that needs justice. Um, uh, I don't really know what is going to happen with the mural. I don't know if the mural is going to stand where it is or is going to be taken down. But certainly art in this community have helped to open up a conversation that even though it's pain painful, it can be free liberating. Mm. So my prayers and hopes is that we are truthful to uh, important values as freedom of speech 
and you know first amendment rights uh for everybody it also charlie's case is also bringing um other issues like the second amendment charlie was um a pro-gun activist uh charlie uh always talk within our communities the importance of brown and black folks to have uh to be organized and to have uh community security based systems um because we live in a town and well and a whole state that has a very marked history of white supremacy so uh I, I, you know, I don't want a gun, and I no recommend people to get guns. But you know, Charlie is definitely uh, Charlie's story is definitely uh, making me think about what the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution really means. Mm. And you know, I like to read a lot, <laughs> and I have started reading some cases because I wanna, I wanna understand. I want to understand, you know, this this truth, and I want to be able to support my community, support myself. And I think that, you know, right now the issues within the situation is about whether the first of the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution is for all. Mm. For all the people in here, or just for a specific group of the population, because uh, the main uh, the main argument uh, we receive from people is that Charlie was armed, but you know we live in a state with is open carry concealed gun. Uh, Charlie was a a, a bet, and in Eugene, Charlie coordinated. Um, Community Armed Self Defense uh, organization who provided training about how to use guns and how to li get licensed and do all this kind of work, uh, specifically open for the community of color. And curiously, uh, now that Charlie is not in this material world, uh, a lot of people who don't know who Charlie were, um, they are like questioning whether like our community deserves to have this, right? Because it's how I feel it. Like, you know, I feel like they are questioning whether we have the right to have a first amendment whether we have the right to use the Second Amendment, you know, uh, I'm, one of the, I'm, I'm not saying I'm pro gun, but you know, I want to know, you know, mm -hmm. if these uh, constitutional rights are for everybody or just for a specific segment of the population. Um, because in my readings, you know, I had been reading a little bit of cases within the federal law system to understand, you know, what are the rights? for people to resist unlawful arrest or like how to resist police brutality. Mm -hmm. You know, because it seems that that is an important thing to know as a person of color within this country. Mm -hmm. um, so I am doing my best to read um, one of the cases is John Battle Elk versus State. The other one is um, Plumber versus State. These two cases uh, encompass uh, precedents of how we should act as civilians when we are facing police brutality of unlawful arrest. So this mural have opened up this conversation now. And this is not me just wondering about things, but all our community is thinking and wondering about the same because uh, 
first we were given a space to to say to to say what we had to say and for our voice to be heard. But now they are saying that they don't like what our voice is saying. Mm -hmm. So I feel like uh, that art is so powerful that even though uh, the perspectives thrown in the media are not the truthful and authentic to the project, those are the ones that are being listened. Uh, also, like yesterday, uh, the artist was able to provide some input regarding the mural and, you know, and the truth of the mural is that a community is mourning as an indigenous migrant Latinx community, we still have our cultural and political rights. We still have the right to mourn our people in the way that we consider appropriate. Uh, also, I feel that at this point is a case of, um, you know, civil rights. And I feel like uh, we never know the truth about Charlie and what happened to Charlie hmm. unless we have um, a compromise between the community and the authorities to clarify what happened. Um, Charlie was uh, shot um, by two police officers in a school. Uh, the argument is that Charlie was armed and that Charlie attacked the police officers. The videos show different things. Um, not all the it seems like parts of the video are there. There's there's like two videos. One is complete and the other is part. Um, the family who supported the mural are the mom, Charlie's mom, and Charlie's brother who supported the mural. Um, the, the other part that don't support the mural is Charlie's ex-wife and the police officers. Uh, I feel that it's important that this case is reviewed, hopefully in the federal level, as it involves important matters of civil rights, uh, especially for people of color. Mm. Do you have, you have a link to, to the um, uh, to the case and Charlie himself, so that we can put it in the show notes for the for people that are more interested in um, yeah following like the whole mural uh, issue, but also like uh, getting to know more about the case that concerning Charlie, because I think that's um, something that we definitely would be interested in uh, keeping in the back of our minds. Uh, I, I would say um, yeah, if, that, if that is possible. Yeah, thank you so much for the interest. I'll be sure to share um, among all the important questions that, you know, like that that the community asks is like, we need clarification on why Charlie was in that school? Mm -hmm. Why were he in the middle of the school? Who called, who called Charlie to go there? Who called the police to go there? Yeah. Um, and yeah, so that that is important, you know, things that need to be clarified. Yeah. Because within the within you know in, in one of the videos that I have seen, Charlie is compliant, and he mm -hmm. got attacked when Charlie was walking, looking forward. So, so in my that is my perspective of what I saw in the video. So I, as an indigenous migrant journalist. And part of the community, I believe that Charlie's story will be will keep coming up because it's a truth that is not being listened. And this is a truth that needs to be heard. And Charlie will be coming back into the conversation in this community until this solves. And mm -hmm. I think this is a great opportunity because it's showing, it's showing like that. People within the city of Eugene 
they really want change and they really want to support change. But we can also see that there is resistance from a specific sector. But I think the healing part in here is to open up to a issue, a problem we have in our community that we're not talking. But now, thanks to the mural, we have the opportunity to do it. Mm -hmm. So I really hope and pray for that the old people involved in this case and in this situation have the power to use this opportunity to create a new reality for our community and hopefully a reality that is welcoming for all. Right. Erica, thank you so much. Like, um, I, 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 I'm actually late for, for a Zoom with, with New York, um, but like, I'm really interested to talk more at, at some point because I think we, we can easily like, fill like three to four hours just talking about um, like your powerful um, journey, your, 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 your curiosity, uh, I would say, like that, that would trigger you um, towards yeah, going for human rights and, and uh, um, creative strategist, strategy and advertising and social media and everything else, teaching. There's so much in between that I would lo love to unpack, um, but like, yeah, it's something that we cannot have uh, unpack in like only like hour, like a little bit over hour. So, um, thank you so much for for being for for being coming on the show, and we'll, let's plan for a longer form conversation um, when you have time, because um, I'm definitely um, looking forward to to yeah, I'm picking your brain. Maybe, maybe that, that that's a better way to to, uh, to describe it. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I appreciate for you to having me in this space for me to share uh, my reality of a Latino indigenous migrant education educator who is an abolitionist. And uh, just let you know that I appreciate everyone out there that is listening to me. Thank you for your time, for your attention. I hope uh, that in any time, in any place I can be of service. I live in Eugene, Oregon, and you can find me as Erika Lincango. And for more information about um, the monitoring of indigenous people's rights that I still do, uh, you can visit Eco Justice Abia Yala in Facebook, which is a page where we are constantly updating different news that come from different territories within the Latino America. And I do that with help with my sister or another indigenous communicators. And the only thing I can tell you that everything I do is not done by myself, you know, without my community, I'm nobody. Uh, mm. My best advice, uh, love your community, support your community, elevate your community. Because when your community is well, you will have the community care you need to. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Erica. And um, yeah, have a great day. Have a great Indigenous Peoples Day over there. And yeah, um, so much love for you for, for doing whatever you do um, and for your for your mindset and everything else. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Till next time. Have a great day. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Do, do, do.